So, Mr. Bucky, man, welcome back to Hamilton College. Thanks, Mark. You just caused a fire drill. <laughs> and, um, but I was very interested in some of the things you were talking about in the country music class and made me think of, we posted your part one interview. We've seen it. And, um, she found it. They had some nice comments. Uh, one person did say, no Dolly Parton. We huh. didn't. We didn't talk about Dolly. And, I don't think that you know, go into the jazz archive. No, we didn't get into the. Well, that's okay. I, I'm. It's all music, right? You can. Well, like Duke Ellington said, there's good music and bad music. Yeah. that's basically it. So I did have a couple <clears throat> of questions um, about your association with her, and when you started working with her, you said uh, eighty nine or so. Mm, yeah. Both of you already had had success. She certainly had had a lot of success yes. going back to the well, yeah. yeah, from the seventies on for her, and then that's when I started playing sessions. I mean, my first session was really nineteen sixty nine and seventy, but I started. I was a session player from seventy three on. I started producing records in seventy seven. So, you both knew your business, and I wondered if hmm. you ever had any like creative control issues between the two of you? Never. No. Why not? We were on a level playing field, if you want to call it that way. I mean, Dolly is Dolly, and she's a fountain of talent, fountain of ideas. But she works fast and likes to work fast. I like to work fast. I had I would put the best musicians around her, the best engineers, the best studio. We, if she didn't write the song, songs, we found the best songs. And no, we never argued about anything creatively at all. In fact, there's just a few times with all the artists I produced that, you know, by the time they got to me, um, if, even if they were a new artist, it was, you know, I kind of showed them the, the ropes in the studio certainly didn't have to show the ropes to Dolly or a lot of the people I worked with, but there were a lot of new artists. So with the experienced artists, there weren't creative differences so much. And even with the new artists, they were trying to get their foot in the door, so they're not going to argue with you. I see. But no, Dolly and I had a great chemistry. Still do. I mean, we're still great friends. Like I said, she was at our wedding in June. Yeah, and you said you're going to 50th anniversary. Two places. October 12th, she's having her, their 50th anniversary of her first appearance on the Opry. And she has uh, 12 tickets. We're two of the 12. Yeah. That's great. She was so prolific, or she is so prolific. I, I wonder if she ever talked about where her song inspiration comes from. Well, I don't like to speak for her, but I've heard her say it enough times. Um, She's a very spiritual. She gets up very early in the morning, three, four, or five, in the, three or four in the morning, and would always walk out and had this thing, hello, God. And um, Dolly has every all of her houses in every room, her office, every room, everywhere she has a place, whether it's L.A., Nashville, East Tennessee, there's a pad and a pencil and a pair of glasses, drugstore glasses, in every room. You walk in, there's a pad, there's a pencil and the glasses. And in her, uh, she has these, in her car, she doesn't drive that much. Someone's usually driving her. But there's always a pad and a pencil in any of her vehicles, of course, on her tour bus. There's a pad and a pencil and a pair of those glasses in every room. So, and the ideas are constant. If we'd be taking a long drive somewhere, and it wasn't just song ideas, she'd say, "Oh, I've got a great idea for a uh, the t the name for a line of clothes," and she'd jot it down. Uh, she'd see a restaurant, set up. that would give her an idea for something else. It was, so it wasn't just song titles or song ideas. It was everything. It was just constantly. And one of my engineers through all of the. Uh, albums with Dolly, Gary Pachosa said one time, he compared me, he said, you're a great editor for Dolly, because it's like, 
a pitcher throwing you 10 fastballs at once, and you got to figure which of those fastballs am I going to catch? Because it's song ideas, songs coming at you like this, and you got to figure out that's the one I got to catch and put that here. Okay, out of this, here's the one, you know, and then there, he, finally you end up with your 10, 12, or 14 songs you're going to record because they come, they come fast and furious, the ideas. And you, or at least I, Gary said, was a great editor to catch the ball, the right ball, and put over here. And some that you didn't pick might end up on the next record? Yeah. Or she, more than once, she, a song that I remember from two years ago, Here It Comes Again, rewritten. Same title, but rewritten, maybe different, some different lyrics and a different, maybe a different melody, a few different chords. That happened more than once. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when she sang um, What a Friend we have in Jesus. She she was she means it. Oh yeah, that was, that was on our live album. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I wouldn't say she's religious as much as spiritual. spiritual. Yeah. Oh. Um, but oh yeah, that's heartfelt. Pretty much. Yeah, that live album was special. Her family was there. You know, country music and and blues especially sort of came from humble origins. Mm. But you never see, hardly ever see a photograph of a country musician or a blues musician where they're not dressed up and looking sharp. I wonder if you have any thoughts about... I'll tell you what she says. Okay. She's always camera ready, she says. Now, of course, if we're sitting around in... Um, her bungalow next to her office going over songs, she's not decked out. But she always said, I'm camera ready when I step out the door because if somebody sees me, if it's the only time they ever see Dolly Parton, I want to look like they think Dolly Parton should look. That's I remember that specifically. And trust me, there are, most artists are not that way. They don't they're not that way. They're not always camera ready. Like, she's always if you see her in public, she's camera ready. And she's that's what she said. I don't want somebody to say I saw Dolly Parton, you won't believe how bad she looked and looked like a, you know, she's always Dolly when she's in public. I see. Yeah. And one of the I don't know if it was a student or something asked actually one of the YouTube comments was how can she play guitar with, with those long nails? And well, I you actually answered it. Well, that. I'll tell you now again. Um, when she gets serious about the songwriting, the, the acrylic nails come off. And she's a serious, she plays. I mean, she's got, a, like I say, a great lick. Like Mabel Carter had a lick. And um, Dolly has a really good lick on the guitar. Uh, claw hammer banjo. Um, dulcimer and auto harp. And, uh, but the way she does it live with the nails and their acrylics and she can do the nails as a percussive instrument that's how she wrote 9 to 5 so I can't do it because I can't make that noise but she can make that noise that sounds like a typewriter stumbled out of the bed and she wrote it like that on the set in her head singing to herself doing the rhythm with the acrylic nails she can make a rhythm sound she can actually I've recorded that sound with something with her but um, when she plays live with the nails, it's an open tuning on her little baby Martin, we call it. Well, of course, now she's using sequin guitars and all this stuff, but it's, it's an old uh, baby Martin, we call it. Her uncle bought it for her use. I think it's 1927 Martin. And that's what all the songs were written on that I know. But she, when she plays live, when she used to take that guitar all the time and never used a strap, it was a little pink and gray cord that tied around the headstock behind the uh, nut and came around here and tied, but it was a little gray and pink cord. And live, she would always open, it was open D, open G, whatever would fit the song. Uh, but she didn't have guitar techs running back and forth with different open tunings for her. But it's all open tuning because if you watch her, She's barring the chords. And sometimes we'll stick a finger in to make it a minor or a seventh or whatever. But it's all bar. It's all open tuning. Usually a D. 
That's great. And if she has to do it in a different key, just put a capo on. That's some nice behind the scenes info right there. Um, so I've got three or four things I'd like to get through to t through okay. today. And um, before the cameras were rolling, you actually answered one of my questions. And it was about um, the spirituals to swing uh, right. re reissue. And I was wondering, this might sound snarky, but what made you think, my question was, what made you believe you were qualified to take on that project? And okay. But then you answered me with all the photographs you were talking about. And well, what, I'll tell you how that all came about. Yeah. Um, I was with Columbia, as you know, Columbia Records for 10, 11, 12 years, VP of A&R. And then, Dolly, then that was when CBS owned Columbia and Epic. And then we, I think it was around 1989, Sony bought Columbia and Epic from CBS. And I stayed on... And then, I can't remember exactly the year, I want to say 97, 96, maybe, I don't know, 95, 96, uh, Sony approached Dolly about doing her own imprint. This will lead to Spirituals to Swing, believe it or not. Her own imprint label. And she called it Blue Eye Records, so the records from then on were Blue Eye slash Sony. And that lasted two years. And then we went to Universal. It was uh, Blue Eye, Sony was on Sony, of course. Tommy Mottola was the president then. Then we went and did it with Universal with Doug Morris. But about, I don't know, a year and a year into it, I, I told Dolly, I said, I just don't think this is going to happen. Because we were supposed to submit new acts to be signed. We were, and they weren't getting signed. And the several of them went on to huge careers with other labels. So I said, I, I don't know, I'm just, I was getting a little antsy, I guess you'd say. And about that same time, Larry Welk, Lawrence Welk's son, approached me, started calling me. I was most of the time in Nashville, but in L.A. a lot. They were in Santa Monica, Welk Music. And he started calling me, and we'd start, we knew each other because he had Welk Music Publishing in Nashville. I knew that one of my best friends ran that. So Larry started calling me and said, you know, we've got the old Vanguard label we bought, and we've just been kind of doing reissues of the old Vanguard jazz series and those things. And, um, well, we want to kind of revamp, you know, ramp it up, he said, and sign some new artists. What would you do? I said, well, if it was me. I'd do the same thing the Solomon Brothers and did in the 50s when they started it in New York. They signed artists no matter what genre it was in. We were talking, I did a jazz class for Doc this morning, and I was talking about um, the Solomon Brothers and starting Vanguard in the 50s in New York. Because they, they would sign Paul Robeson after he'd been blackballed in the Red Scare, and the Weavers after they had been blackballed in the Red Scare. And, uh, of course, the jazz series, I know you're familiar with all that. It was like, it was not one genre of music on Vanguard in the 50s. If it was a great artist, no matter what, even the political backlash in the 50s, it, Vanguard. I said, I'd do the same thing the Solomon Brothers do. Just find great artists, no matter what the genre, and make it an artist-friendly label. And he'd call me, and he'd call me and pick my brain. And I remember getting off the phone one day, and I told my assistant then, Jenny, I said, I think he's going to offer me a job. And she said, what would you do? I said, I would take it and you'd do it with me. You'd still be my assistant. And it did, it, I went out to L.A. on one of the trips and went to Santa Monica, and he did offer me the position. And uh, I, by that time I had told Dolly that, you know, Larry Welks offered me this job to do Vanguard. And I said, it's like, it would open up a whole new arena for me of different types of music, signing new artists. And she said, jump on it, do it. Dolly said that to me. Mm -hmm. And then she stayed on Universal. And so I went to Vanguard, based in Santa Monica. I was back and forth once a month to the point I had a condo in Santa Monica. I was there once a month. And... Um, 
right after I got there, we bought Sugar Hill Records in Durham, North Carolina, which was primarily a bluegrass label. Doc Watson and Doyle Lawson and Quicksilver, groups like that. And um, June of 1999, get on a plane to go to L.A., sit down, who walks in and sit, gets in the seat right in front of me, Dolly. We just happened to get on the same plane. And I tapped her on the shoulder. Oh, she <laughs> flipped out and made whoever was sitting next to her move, change seats with me. And I, so we sat together on the way to L.A. It was June of 99. And I said, during the conversation, I said, we bought this label in Durham, North Carolina, Sugar Hill Records, Bluegrass, this, that. I said, would you ever consider doing a bluegrass record? So we started talking about it on that flight and went to dinner that night in L.A. and put the whole idea together. And she said, I've got to do a movie uh, the rest of this month in July. I could, I'd be, I'm open August. So I said, I'll put it together. And got the best musicians, bluegrass musicians. She called it God's Bluegrass Band. And we went in in a day and a half when we cut the album, The Grass is Blue, which won the Grammy, Best Bluegrass Album, won the IBMA, Bluegrass Music Association, Best Bluegrass Album. And then, so now she was signed to Sugar Hill. The label I was back, you know, I had Vanguard and Sugar Hill, so things had gone full circle. And the following year, we did the follow-up, Little Sparrow won the Grammy. And... Like I said, we're still friends to this day. So it all came around, but while I was at Vanguard, started at Vanguard, I was wandering around in the vaults one day. And I, you know, I knew they had done the Spiritualist to Swing, um, you know, the old 33 yeah. and a third LP. But I got to looking in the vault, and I came across a whole shelf, STS, STS, and I pull it out, and it's Spiritualist to Swing, and I went, I got chills. I get chills now thinking about it. It was originally recorded on disc when John Hammond did the concerts in 1938 and 39 at Carnegie Hall. So it, had to, it was recorded on disc. They were transferred to tape uh, in the 19, early 50s when that album, the first Spiritual Swing album came out, yeah. LP. But I found that here were the tapes that had been transferred from the disc. And I got to looking through this stuff, and I had a, I had my own big two-track recorder, bigger than that. It was that much wider and that much taller. So I sat in my office and started listening to these tapes, and it was, the quality was phenomenal. Tape in the 50s and even in the 60s held up much better than tape in the 70s and 80s, because... I've heard that. Oh, well... We, it was awful, and the tape that was made in the 70s, especially, when you went back, it just started shredding, and, and you stopped. And so we came up with the idea, literally, we were putting them in little ovens, and we called it baking the tapes to keep them from just flaking all the, you know, if you ran it through one time, it was gone. There was all the, <laughs> the oxide laying on the table. So one of the guys got the idea about baking them, and now they do it very, it's very sophisticated. But I started, you know, I was kind of skeptical when I saw those tapes, and I put it on, and was, I was there waiting to see the flakes, the oxide, and it was not, and it, the quality was phenomenal, the recording quality, and the tape had held up. So, I called a friend of mine and had a studio in L.A. Well, actually, Doug Sachs, the mastering lab, mm -hmm. who was, was at that time it's still in Hollywood. I called Doug. I said, I'm bringing over some boxes of tapes. I need to get safeties made of these because these were the only copies of that con those two concerts. So once I had the copies made, because I was a little nervous, like I'm saying, this is it. This is, if something yeah. goes wrong, if it breaks or stretches, this is ruined, or if, God forbid if it starts, the oxide starts flaking off. So Doug made, the, of course, he was the best mastering guy. And now I had safeties. So now I could sit in my office with a two track and listen to this stuff. And, and I knew I had the, here's over here I had the LP, which, like I said, you could only get about 30 minutes on an LP, both sides total.
And of course, these are hours long concerts. Basie and the boogie woogie, woogie piano players, and uh, you know, everybody's on that album. And I knew the album pretty well by memory. And I started listening. I said, wait a minute, I don't remember this section, you know. And I literally started fi- finding places because, you know, the Goodman Band was there the second year, I believe it was. Mm-hmm. Basie was both years. And all those great artist and I started finding solos that had been cut out to make make it all fit on this one album the 33 and a third LP and you were very limited in your time you know back in those days but because once it got to the inside of an album if you tried to cram too much it would just start skipping the needle would start skipping when they cut those solos out then they were splicing tape mm-hmm there were splices I uh, so what I was finding was the tape with the splicing, the splices, and you know how the white splice tape looks. Yeah. But they were cut right, diagonally. They were professionally edited. But then on other reels, I started hearing pieces of things. Or I'd hear one that was not edited. And I said, I don't remember that. And I'd start listening, and I'd start making, I had tablets filled with notes. And then I'd start finding reels with just, it was spliced, but you'd start playing it and it'd be like a solo, a sax trading off with an electric guitar, and then that would go on for a while, and it'd be a splice, and then here's another solo from a totally different song. It was just solos on these reels, spliced together. And I started, I started listening, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that's Lester Young trading off with Charlie Christian these things I get chill bumps as you can imagine <laughs> so I I started I was literally I don't know how many legal pads I filled with notes on this and uh, got with Doug Sachs and started constructing this stuff and started now I had by then I had two sets of safeties made so I could keep one in Santa Monica and at Doug's place in Hollywood and also a set that I could take back to Nashville and be working on this in one of my other studios with other mastering engineers. And um, it took a long time, as you can imagine, to piece this together. And I still couldn't put it all in the box set. Mm-hmm. But it's this the box set is the best of the two concerts by far. Some of it was, I mean, it was John Hammond with a an old Victrola on the stage, on a stool, playing some old records. I mean, this is in Carnegie Hall, and yeah. they had a microphone with him playing a Victrola. Because I, when I, I talked to Mr. Hammond about this at one time, before he even got to Welk, because he was talking about all that stuff. So I remembered all that, but there was, that was on the tapes. It was, as you can imagine, playing those old 78s on a Victrola on stage at Carnegie Hall with a microphone. It was terrible. Tinny and almost inaudible but that's how he would start the concert and I just thought well that's historically valuable the tapes are certainly still in existence but I thought that's not going to work for the CD box set so anyway it was an extensive uh, undertaking but it was a labor of love Mm -hmm. and uh, I did know the music and I knew Mr. Hammond like I was talking about, I don't. You weren't there this morning when I was talking about John Hammond, because when I do my classes, rhythm and blues tore down the walls of segregation. My first class is about John Hammond, how he talked to Benny Goodman into hiring Teddy Wilson and in integrated music in 1935. Then Lionel Hampton, then Charlie Christian, and I talked to my students about this is 12 years before Jackie Robinson right. and the Dodgers. And that's, that's why my whole basis of my class is music played the bigger part of integrating society than the courts or baseball or something like that. So I knew Mr. Hammond, I knew the music, and I was confident I could do it. Some of his uh, statements in the, the paragraph here in the liner, original liner notes, the music nobody knows, are quite... Um, illuminating about the time he said the music of these hot musicians and their talented colleagues must first be considered as music it is not as ignorant people contend a sort of anarchy in music 
That sounds like him. Yeah. Is that from my liner notes that I put that in there? It, it's from, from the set? original, okay. sp- yes, from the box set, yes. Well, because I found the original program in uh-huh. the New York Public Library, and it was all yellowed, and I, I had a, a dust-up with our art director. Because if you notice in the set, it's got the Bessie Smith picture, and it's, it's the, the original program, but I had to format it I see. to fit in the box. Because, you know, it's this wide yeah. instead of this wide to fit in the box set. But it was all yellow, and I loved it. And I made copies in the New York Public Library. But the art director at Welk in Santa Monica got into because when the art the artwork came back to me for my first approval, she had taken all the yellow out of it, and it was white. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, that was part of the charm, yeah, is the right. yellowed paper from all those decades. And we got into it about it, and... Larry well, backed me, and I got my way about the yellowed-looking program. But if you notice on the liner notes, my name is not on there. <laughs> she accidentally left my name off. The, and oh. they called me in after everything had been done, and Larry called me and said, well, he showed me this. He said, um, your, your name is left off, the liner notes. And everybody was already telling me, this is going to win the Grammy for the best liner notes. But he said... We can stop production. It's going to take us a month or two to redo it, to get your name on. I said, screw it. Put it out wow. like this. But that's why my name is not on. My name is, I'm obviously credited as the, the new, the, the re-release producer. Right. I, how great is that? Produced by John Hammond, re-release produced by Steve Buckingham. You can't beat that. You're one of your idols and mentors. Yeah, if he said uh, you've had a big role in a piece of history, I'm wondering if the people that went to this concert and they're reading uh, in the notes, the producers of this concert ask one indulgence from the audience. Most of the people on the program are making their first appearance before a predominantly white audience. Many of them never visited the North before. Uh, They'll do their best if the audience will cooperate by creating an atmosphere of informality and interest. At Carnegie Hall. At Carnegie Hall. (laughs) Pretty heavy. It is very heavy. Yeah. And um, you know the story too. He couldn't get a sponsor. Mm. Do you know the story on I that? I don't know that. If you look on the um, my original program that I found, at the top, you know, is the the drawing of Bessie Smith, mm-hmm. who died before the concert. Obviously, he wanted Robert Johnson, but right. Johnson had been killed. <laughs> I mean, he's, you know, that's just the way it was, and um, so. Anyway, if you look at that, the program in the box set, at the top it says, The New Masses Present Spirituals to Swing. John Hammond went to everybody in New York to sponsor, get sponsoring for the program that helped pay for it. The NAACP turned it down because they, he said, you know, that's, we don't want to be associated with blues and swing music. That's a little beneath the NAACP. He went to everybody in New York, and when you look on there, it says, The New Masses Present. The New Masses was a communist newspaper in New York, and that's the only person, the only group he could get to help sponsor the first concert. I'll be done. And, of course, Mr. Hammond talked about that, you know, he was such a radical, especially about... Desegregating, desegregating everything, not just music, nightclubs, the army when he got in, chose for the troops, he wanted to desegregate everything, and did. And um, so he was labeled, labeled a radical. Yeah. And some you? people, even because of the new masses thing, he's a communist, but he didn't get caught in the Red Scare thing in the 50s. His family was wealthy, correct? The Vanderbilt family. Yes, so yeah. he had the sort of financial luxury of taking these causes to and really getting behind them. As he said, he, I had the means to pay for my... He paid for the sessions for Basie and Billie Holiday. He paid for those things himself. So he, well, he, was, some, he was his own bank for that stuff. There's some real gems on the thing. and I, I was listening to the one um, stomping at the Savoy with a Benny Goodman... Sextet, and I hadn't looked at the personnel, but I was, I'm hearing this jump, 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 and I go, man, Freddie Green's really going at it. 
And then I looked, and it was Charlie Christian. Yeah. And that surprised me, I guess, because I'm not sure I had heard Charlie Christian do that. I was more familiar with his oh, yeah. solo. Oh, yeah. On the electric. And, but, you know, they could do. Now, I'll tell you a funny story that Sweets told me, Sweets Edison. Of course, Freddie Green was the guy on, you know, the arch top acoustic rhythm. Although Chet Atkins knew everybody. He told me the best rhythm guitarist he ever heard was um, Homer and Jethro, uh, Homer Haynes. Remember Homer and Jethro, mm -hmm. the guitar and mandolin yeah. kind of comedy duo? He said Homer Haynes was the best of the old arch top rhythm players. Freddie Green was second. And, the, and those guys, the action on their guitars was up this high. I mean, it was impossible to fret those things, but Freddie Green was the guy, man. But Sweets told me that one time Freddie Green shows up with an amplifier and a pickup on his guitar. And, you know, they said they hated the sound because, you know, the way he, that chunk, 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 you know, every beat's a, you know, chord change. And so during a break, Lester Young took a pair of wire cutters and went in the amp and started snipping wires and everything. So he came back, so Freddie Green gave up on the electric guitar. That's why you never heard Freddie Green playing electric. But, you know, I think, I haven't looked at the box set in years. I've got copies at home, but, um, you know, some, I think I pointed this out in there. Some of it was redone in the studio, mm -hmm. and I've even got the pictures I think I put in there. I yes, know I've got indeed. one at the house. And it's uh, Freddie Green and Charlie Christian, and Basie and Goodman, Joe Jones, and, you know, yeah. Lester Young, Buck Clayton. So they redid some things in the studio, and... Uh, I talk about it in there. I'm, you know, they'd never talked about it before, but Mr. Hammond had told me. And in my, all my delving around and all the notes and the tapes and everything, I found all that stuff too. But um, yeah, not too bad to have Freddie Green and Charlie Christian playing and Lester Young trading off with them. And I know it's, like I say, Do heavy you think stuff. it would have been, uh, I hesitate to say better, if those concerts had been totally miked like they would today, would it have... It would have certainly been different. I don't think it would have been better. Yeah, that's why I wondered about better. No, um, this morning in the class, this jazz class this morning, I was talking about recording. And I said, when I started recording, it was on four track. These guys were doing it mono, of course, on disc and even when the tape started was mono and then two track and eventually three track then four track i started in 69 on four track and then it was we'd go to philadelphia george massenberg my oldest friend in the business who's the man he invented parametric equalization and all this stuff we're still friends but george and i would go from baltimore where he had a studio a four track we go up to philadelphia to sigma sound because they had an eight track and then George built his own 16-track console and got an Ampex 16-track, and then the 24-track analog, and then eventually 48-track digital, still on tape. And that was a nightmare. And then, um, I mean, Scotch, or 3M made a, the first digital 48-track I saw, but they would actually, there were tape, cotton things to clean the tape every time it came around, and they were notorious for, fire spinning out of the back of the first 48 track machines but then it went to digital digital but i said like i told the students today now you've got on your computer if you want to use 200 tracks you can i said but it doesn't make the music better i said the beatles records were on four track and so anyway the point is if they had had individual mics like we do now for the spirituals to swing concerts i don't think it would have been better it would have been different but, you know, there's a thing about capturing that overall, the sound like that. You know, in the, the old days, those guys were singing, like Jimmy Rush and those guys were singing with no microphones okay. and just carrying over the whole band because there were no mics on stage. Well, that's why I, when I listen to the, uh, the bass scene, they call it the All-American Rhythm Section, mm -hmm. it just sounds like one entity because they, I don't know if they were, so totally conscious of 
balancing their own volume, but they surely did. Oh, yeah. And I had an experience once of on multiple, this, this one night after the other at a festival, I heard the the L.A. Uh, Joggernaut big band, mm -hmm. Frankie Kep and Matt mm -hmm. Pierce, and they had mics all over the place. Yeah, well, that's the way it's and, done. And it blew your head off. Mm -hmm. The next night, the Count Basie Orchestra, uh, read by Grover Mitchell at the time, no, Frank Foster. At any rate, they had like three mics on stage, and it was so much better. Yeah. They just, the band was in control rather than... And you mix yourself. They mixed themselves. Yeah. And when studio all the studio players, when I was playing sessions, and we would go out to play gigs with some artist or something, they'd pay for, have us come out with them, we could mix ourselves from stage. We were so used to knowing what we sounded like in our headphones mm -hmm. in the studio, once we were on the stage, we knew exactly how to... We had our own level set. They put the mics up, but they didn't. there was not a, a lot of mixing going on on the console out front, we mixed ourselves, of course, those guys, you talking about basses, or any of those rhythm sections, they mixed themselves, you know, Jimmy Lunsford, Chick Webb, those guys, I can only imagine, in those little clubs, in the, that 18 piece band, in those, that, those were not big clubs, like on 52nd Street in New York, but can you imagine that big band, but everybody else knows that it was perfect, sounds but John Hammond would talk about it was like a you were hearing a record off that stage at one of the clubs on 52nd Street and I it's just like I say you got 200 tracks if you want to use them now it's not going to make it a better record mm -hmm. if you had 25 mics on stage or more now of course that's the way it is done now but it's not I don't think, again, going back to your original question, spiritual swing, I'll just say, it would not have been better with more mics. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have been better with today's recording techniques. It's just the way those guys played. And they did mix themselves. And the other thing, I remember Mel Powell, I was talking about, who started with Goodman mm -hmm. after Teddy Wilson, told me, it was a great expression, he said, our instruments never got cold because they would play radio shows in the mornings They'd play matinees doing something. They'd play a dance or a concert and then a dance. And then when they're done with that, 12 or 1, they all headed to Harlem to, to sit in and jam. So they played, you know, 16, 17 hours a day, more. And he said, that was a great expression. I'll never forget, our instruments never got cold. So, yeah the All-American Rhythm Section, you can only imagine how much they played. It's not just they played a gig each night. They played all the time. Mm -hmm. So they were like one instrument, those bands. The rhythm sections, were the, the brass section, the woodwinds, they were like one, here's one instrument, here's one instrument, here's one instrument. The rhythm section, the brass, and the woodwinds. Were those the good old days? Well, they certainly were. I wish I'd have lived in that time to really, I mean, I got to see the last of the big bands. When I got first started doing orchestra dates in L.A., over to, you know, string dates, orchestra dates, uh, 60 pieces, a lot of the horn players were from those that era, uh, the big band era. So I got to hear the stories. Larry Welk told me great stories. The guys, the guys that his father had in the Lawrence Welk band were big band guys. Yes. And they were, you know, they'd take breaks and you know, Lawrence Welk would go to his dressing room and eat a chicken salad sandwich. They were at the bar some down the street and um, Larry was the band boy running errands for him. Oh. So he knew all the stories from these guys. They'd all played with the big bands. They'd put on their suits and do the Lawrence Welk show, but these guys could swing if they really wanted to or, or were allowed to. But I knew a lot of the big band guys. Uh, the first time I did the Tonight Show, when Johnny Carson was still the host. I mean, Severinsen played with Tommy Dorsey. Those guys are all big, mostly big band alumni. And they heard, you heard all the stories, and um, they were obviously good old days. But when I came along, it was still good old, old days, because those guys were still around, playing orchestra dates, like I say, in L.A. And they were, you know, the Hollywood film scores on the big sound stages. 
that's those those were a lot of the horn players were from the 40s and so I still got to experience that and Les Brown still had his band when I was out in LA and I got, went to the Palladium I somehow met his granddaughter or somebody anyway and he still had um, oh who was this, the male singer with Les Brown and the band of renown Butch Stone he was still singing with Les Brown um, in oh. the band of renown yeah. And I went to see them at the Palladium, where all the big bands played. I was the last of the big bands. Uh, actually, the last of the big bands was Severinsen's band on The Tonight yeah. Show. Did you ever hear those fellows complain or comment about the transition f- from swing to rock and roll? It was more of the, they talked in this just... I, that brings to mind when you say that they it wasn't so much swing the big bands to rock and roll it was swing music the war the Glenn Miller Army Air Force Band which was like the hand picked the best of every big band Glenn Miller got but when the war was over nobody could afford the big bands hardly anymore what they talked more about was when Bop came in oh. that not so much I never heard them say anything about rock and roll but when Bop came in Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Parker, that was a different world from the world they played. And that's that's the comments I heard more. Never about rock and roll. Because they played on, you know, sometimes they would use sax sections or something, sax sections on rock and roll records. There was studio work for those guys. But they weren't called for bop records. That's true. You know. I never thought of it that way from a... Uh, employment standpoint. I mean, you know, the band shrunk. and uh, But yeah, especially the saxophone players, a lot of them found work in the rock and roll. Oh, brass sections. and woodwinds. Yeah. Uh, especially in Hollywood mm-hmm. for the film scores. And for my big, when I was producing big pop records like Deanna Warwick and things like that, you'd, I'd cut the tracks where Nashville, no, back then it would be Atlanta or Nashville or in L.A., but then you do your, they call it sweetening dates. Yeah. And you go in and you have the big, well, my string sections were usually 12, 4, 4, and 2, 12 violins, 4 violas, 4 cello, and uh, 4, 4, and 2, and 2 string basses. And then we, if we had the budget, I'd do, you use like 18 violins and, you know, and scale them, but we always... We'd do 12, 4, 4, and 2 and double it. Mm-hmm. So it was like a huge string section. But then we'd also have, a if it was an orchestra date, not just a string date, we would call it, we'd have this, the strings. And uh, this woman named Gail Levant on the harp, you know, doing the glissandos and all that stuff. And then the brass section and the woodwind section. So I think the biggest sections I worked with were 65 pieces in L.A., and you talk about, you don't show stress, but when you've got 65 people sitting out there in the clock, you better be starting on time because you've got to get your three or four songs in that three-hour session or they're off to the next session. Or if you, God forbid, you went into overtime because that, with 60 pieces. <laughs> so I had my arranger, my conductor, me. I mean, we all had our phones on at the podium. I mean, it was... And plus, you, you can imagine how many mics that took to set up. We had, we'd start setting up at 6 in the morning for 9 or 10 o'clock session. So you don't want to be sitting there waiting for engineers to finish setting up microphones with 65 people looking at you. And you hope the smoke alarm or the fire alarm uh, well, doesn't go off like it did today. I've had some things happen. I had a roof collapse in a control room one time with... A, Water on a roof came crashing, and I dived onto the console, and my engineer dived over the tape machine. I never had a fire alarm go off, but I'll tell you one thing that happened. There was a great arranger in L.A. named Gene Page, and I'm sitting there. I think usually our sessions would be 10 to 1, 2 to 5, 6 to 9, and if you went late, 10 to 1 in the morning, but then you're into an hour overtime after midnight. So you usually did your three sessions a day. I had a 10 o'clock date in L.A. It was a big string date. There was a man named Sid Sharp who was the concert master. 
And the second was always a fellow named Jimmy Getzoff. And there Jimmy and Sid's right in front of me. And they're you know, looking at the clock. I'm looking at my watch. No gene page. No charts. No music. No charts. Oh, no. And, uh, you know, so finally it was like five till. And Gene, uh, Sid Sharp looks at me and said, who's, who's doing the arrangements? And I said, uh, Gene Page. And, you know, he rolled his eyes oh, back. Oh, the and look. Oh. And he said, oh, my God. He said, we did a Manilow session. He was like an hour late last week. So then, you know, you feel your stomach, you know, just, you know, you don't show it. But finally, the door flew open, right at like one minute till. And literally, he comes in with the, the charts tra tra trailing out behind him. It was like out of a movie. And, you know scramble to get the charts laid out and we started maybe seven minutes late and we got it all in but um of course on the rundown you everybody you all have your scores in front of you the conductor my arranger and me and as you as they run it down you just circle mistakes because there's always mistakes on a big chart with a big section like that and you you know it's just being run down you're more bar 64, bar, you know, and you go back and say, okay, then my ranger would say, change that to E to E flat, you, you know, you correct it, but it has to be done like that. And um, then you do your take. And then, I, would, I shouldn't say this, but it's all way back now, but I do a take I'd call it a rundown with the string section. I said, let's do a rundown after we got our mistakes correct. Let's run it down one more time to be sure I'd record it. Okay, let's do the take now. We do the take. They knew what I was doing. They knew I was getting a double out of them because you have to pay for a double. They didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. It's called a double and it's on the contract. You know, your thing, then a double and a, it's all listed. So if they, they knew what I was doing, but they liked me enough, and I gave them enough work that they weren't busting me. Wait a minute, we know what you're They knew exactly what I was doing, because everybody was doing it. So you'd, instead of having a 12, 4, 4, and 2 section, now you have a 24, 8, 8, and 4 section. And it made, oh, you were recording them over themselves. I didn't play it back to them. When they, I, I see said, what okay, what, you do your first rundown to make, correct your mistakes. Then, okay, now that we've got our mistakes correct, let me do another rundown. Roll the tape. <laughs> and the tape would be rolling. And they do the part. Sounds great. Let's do our take one. It, we wouldn't play the first rundown back, so Easy. they weren't hearing that in the phones. Great. Next song. Right. Same routine for the next song. Mm -hmm. Correct the mistakes, run down, roll the tape. Then the double, and then it really was a double, but we weren't paying for a double. Now, if I had if I had an unlimited budget, I was very open. Okay, we would actually do triples sometimes, mm -hmm. and you but you pay for every pass, you know, pass every recording. I thought that whatever you could do in three hours, that you could do. No, nope. oh, okay. it was there's a section on the contracts. Um, you know, there, there's the first take, or whatever you want to call it. And if it was a double, there's another column. If there was a step out, a solo, that was another column. If Sweets was going to step out and do a obligato, that's a separate section. A step out solo, you were paid extra for that too. Mm -hmm. So not, it wasn't what, everything you get in three hours, there's your session. There was all those little categories, and there was definitely a thing for solo step outs, they called it. So if a sax stepped out, in, I'm talking about during the take, if he stepped in and did a solo, or Sweets did a solo, or whatever, whoever, there's another column for that. You get paid extra for that, each guy who took a solo. Who's paying that bill, the record company? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to be very cognizant of all that. 
Oh my God! Yeah, yeah I had to do the your, budget. You had to do the budget. Yeah, ahead of time. Yeah, you know, if this was, if you had a back in those days, if you had a hundred and fifty thousand dollar budget, you had to figure out not only what the musicians were going to cost, not just the rhythm section, but the string date, orchestra date, travel, hotels, for the artists, for me, whatever. You know, all that had. I mean, even down to me catering the meals for the rhythm section. Everything. It was an extent. I had a whole pages of sheets that I would fill in for each album I was doing. You know, I had to do the budget and um, if you know if it was a hundred grand, hundred and fifty grand, two hundred grand, you'd be surprised how quick that could go back in those days. Was your uh, fee in that? No. That was no. separate. No. I I was paid uh, my production fee. Mm -hmm. And I was paid my royalty points. Okay. That was separate. Okay, I don't know if you can answer this question. It's fill in the blanks. I'll try. A hit song needs blank. A great song. A hit song needs a great song. Oh, I thought you meant a, a, a hit record. A hit record needs... A great song. Okay, does it need anything else? Great musician. Well, in my time, a great, great music. First of all... Is an old expression in Nashville. It all starts with a song. As I've said ad nauseum, I can have the best musicians in the world, the best engineer, the best artist. If it's a mediocre song, it's going to be a mediocre record. That held true throughout my career. I don't know that it holds true now, but if you don't have a great song, you don't have a hit record. You don't have a great record. I, everything else could be the best in the world. If it's a lousy song, it's going to be a lousy record. Yesterday, in your film compilation, I don't know if Andrew Young said this or if you inserted this, but I believe it was like the music comes first and the lyrics. That was Andrew Young. That's okay. when he made the statement about you could say that music was more successful than the courts in integrating society. And he said people would be singing along with it, like with the impressions he was talking about, Curtis Mayfield and the impressions. Mm -hmm. He said, and it's only until later you realize what you're singing, the lyric, you know, and what you're th singing about. Every, you're singing along, and then later, whoa, you know, people get ready, there's a train, you know, we're talking about the movement, the civil rights movement right. here. Yeah, that was Andrew Young. That, you know, it's an astute comment. Um, I want to talk about the blues. No uh, more fill in the blanks? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll think of some. Um, I am always uh, feel there's something, not always, but oftentimes when I read about the blues, mm -hmm. the, the main thrust of what people write about is, is the emotion and the social conditions that gave rise to that music. And there's pretty short shrift given to the 12-bar musical form of the blues. And what reminded me of it is yesterday when you're at the beginning of your, your film, and we were talking about rockabilly and rock and roll. Mm -hmm. All those songs were 12-bar blues. 12-bar blues, yeah. And I don't know if it's just because it's too much a technical musical thing, but I don't think the 12-bar blues... Is, gets the recognition it should as this incredible, precise uh, musical form that can be used in so many different ways. Well, I obviously began my life, my career, playing basically 12-bar blues, whether it was rhythm and blues, blues, soul music, in the in the early days, rhythm and blues, soul music, country. And basically, you're talking about 12 bar manuscripts. Clapton has it, there's a great thing on Clapton. It's called A Life in 12 Bars. Oh, yeah. That's, that sums it up, isn't it? Doesn't it? Now, of course, things got way more sophisticated, but that's to me, I mean, I'm not the, the guy who said, oh, that's what it was. It was all based on 12 bar blues. I'm not the first person to say that, but it is. And you're right, it is sold short, looked down on. 
Uh, but it shouldn't be because it's the basis for so much of it, so much music. Things got much, as you know, jazz got more sophisticated, swing bands got more sophisticated, but you go back to the early days of blues, rock and roll, rhythm and blues, soul music, and it's basically still a form of 12-bar blues, Mm -hmm. I think. I mean, don't you? Yes, I do. Yeah. Sort of why I wanted your opinion on it. Um, It's so elastic. It's like a chameleon almost, you know. Whatever you want it to be, you can can do with it. Mm -hmm. You know. Is there an American music? Well, this is my opinion. Um, Country music is American music. It was like... um, the poor white man's blues. Blues I feel, is a, an American art form. Jazz is, is an American art form. And uh, bluegrass is an American art form. Now it's played all over, all these genres, these different forms of music are played all over the world. But where did it start? Louis Armstrong, uh, Bill Monroe, Hank Williams, you know, and others in the country. I mean, it's an Ameri- those are American art forms, in my opinion. Good answer. Um, not sure I can verbalize this question, but sometimes I read sociologists writing about music, and then you read musicians talking about where their music came from. And a lot of times they're not sort of on the same page. Mm. I wonder if how much you feel the social conditions that um, musicians grow up in affects their musicianship. Good question. Um, Well, if you look at the greats, the legends, they certainly didn't come from affluent backgrounds. Louis Armstrong certainly doesn't, didn't. Um, Hank Williams certainly didn't. I think you go to any great, legendary musician, and it usually comes, I mean, Dolly, very humble backgrounds. We were talking about, I mean, really humble backgrounds. And a lot of these people, in whether it's country, blues, jazz, Rock and roll. Elvis certainly didn't come from a fluent background. He was influenced by Chuck Berry and Fats Domino and Little Richard. They certainly didn't come from a fluent background, nor did James Brown. So I think that has a huge impact on the musician coming up from humble backgrounds. But then again, look at the person who really had such an impact on society, John Hammond did come from a fluent background, but he was not a musician. But he recognized good musicians and was a great, had great ears, but came from a very good fluent background. That's the way he was able to pay for those early records. But the musicians, I can't say there's no musician I've ever met who didn't come from a wealthy family, maybe, but we never talked about it. But most of us grew up the same way, you know, lower middle class, middle class, listening to a lot of the same music, uh, struggling, uh, especially studio guys I knew from everywhere. Uh, I always likened it to this mob of people trying to get through a keyhole to be a studio musician. And just, you know, a few at a time can slip through, you know. Everybody wanted to do, everybody, I always said, I just was talking about this yesterday, that most of the time when you go out and see somebody on the road playing concerts, that's not the people who played on the record. It's a road band. Everybody out on the road wants to be a studio musician, or at least used to be. They all wanted to be in the studio. They did this hoping that it was going to lead to that. And I always likened it to a mob trying to get through a keyhole. And we all grew up, I don't care if we got, and we came from everywhere. It's just like actors and actresses that flocked to Hollywood. We went to music centers, whether it was Nashville, Memphis, Muscle Shoals, New York, 
L.A., Detroit, Philadelphia. We came from everywhere and found each other mm -hmm. and were let in through the keyhole. And we all had similar backgrounds. Some of the guys I know, like Hungate, we spoke about David Hungate earlier, North Texas State, that great one o'clock jump jazz band. You know, he could read everything. But he, his father was a judge up in uh, Indiana. But David, believe me, once he got out of North Texas State and went to L.A., he had to work his way up the ranks. I mean, Toto was one thing, but they were all studio, young studio guys, Picaro and Hungate and all those guys. They all had to, you know, they had to compete and prove themselves like all of us did. And you have to do the same thing as a producer. At least the way, this is the way it used to be. Now, somebody told me today, one of the students said something to me about, I was talking about the recording and how it used to be, the studios, and a student said, yeah, but you know, it might be more democratized now because everybody can make a record. And I said, well, yeah, you're right. Everybody who has a laptop can put on GarageBand and make a record. But it is democratized. But I said, to me, to my ears and my experience, it sounds like somebody sitting down with their computer making a record. It's not the same. We all were into high fidelity. George Massenburg was talking, I want the records to be hi-fi. We wanted our stuff to sound hi-fi. Our instruments, the records that we were, I was producing them, it was like the, we wanted it to be there. And now, I keep talking about this. Carol and her, my wife hears this all the time about the bar keeps getting lower and lower and lower. Now, that's an old guy talking in retrospect. You know, I, I don't want to be one of the, the old guys talking about, well, in my day. But, you know, it was. You had to be. To, to do what we did, you had to be great as a player or as a producer or as a songwriter or as an engineer. Or you didn't get work the next week. Is it, is it true that um, the majority of the pop, pop icons never went to music school? They were self-taught musicians who mm -hmm. learned either with mentors or just through doing it. When you talk about pop icons, you're talking about the legendary singers or somebody like that, I guess. Yes. I think so. I don't know any singer I ever worked with. Well, no, I can tell you a couple. Uh, when I produced Dion Warwick's albums for Clive Davis, uh, Dion had gone, she was a music teacher. And we were in a, doing a session one day. It was a Michael McDonald song that must have had, oh, dozens of chord changes in it. and it was a oh it was fast I can't even remember the name of the song and I had the best guys and uh, the guitarist that day was Larry Byron from Muscle Shoals Larry had played with Steppenwolf at one time then went back to Muscle Shoals and was one of the best studio guitars Larry had written a ch uh, sketched out the chart that I we did it together and anyway, in the middle of this song with dozens of chord changes going a mile a minute, Dion and the mic said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. What? She said, there's a wrong chord in there. So we all gather around the piano with the charts and start playing. And there, she said, right there. And Because right before we put the charts down on the piano, I leaned over to Larry. I said, how sure are you about the chart? He said, I'd bet my life on it. And it, anyway, in this fast up-tempo thing with dozens of chord changes. She heard, there was actually like, I don't know, I'm just gonna make this chord up, an E flat, nine flat seven. Anyway, there was one note in the chord that was a half a step off in our chart, and she heard it. So, that kind of, you know, you, that put you on your toes, you know. So she picked that, and it was not the, uh, she heard it. And we all, when she pointed it out, there's the wrong chord. That's true. And we, and we put on Michael McDonald's demo, and there it was. One note and a chord was a half a step off.
you know, it was supposed to be a, a, a instead of a seven, it was supposed to be a flat seven or something, or major seven. And was, some note was a half yeah. a step off. So there is an example of somebody who did go to okay. school. That's the only singer I can think of off the top of my head mm -hmm. that went to school. Yeah. Uh, and subsequently, she took us to school that day. Uh, but most, I can't think of any other singers who were schooled like that. Well, maybe some jazz singers or something like that. But now there were musicians. I taught myself to read. I taught myself theory. But guys like Hungate studied at North Texas yeah. State. And then there were other guys who studied. Matt Rawlings, a keyboard player I mentioned earlier, went to, he went to Berkeley for a couple of years. And he dropped out, went to Nashville, and took, he took off. He's out on the road right now with uh, Allison Krauss. We just saw Allison and Matt and the guys a few weeks ago. And uh, so when he hit town, he could read fly papers, we say. Hungate could read fly papers. Most of the guys could. You had to. You, but in the South, too, we had number charts mm -hmm. to contend with. Well, not to contend with. That's what I learned. It was like writing the charts in numbers rather than manuscript paper. And I, I think I've shown you some of the examples of that. I, I've shown some of the students today in that jazz class. And they were wanting to take pictures of one of the number charts because it was like, it looks like an algebra form. Yes. When you look at the page. And I can remember specifically one time, it was on a Melissa Manchester Christmas album, and I had Eddie Gomez flying to Nashville from New York and Lewis Nash on drums. And um, I put out the number charts for, you know, things like White Christmas, I'll Be Home for, I don't know what, the, you know, the different standards. And Eddie looked at the, now, of course, Eddie Gomez uh, can play, and he looked at the chart, and I was, he said, what the hell is that? And I said, well, it's a number chart. Well, you know, I said, but, you know, just look at it as one is the root. The root, yes. And he looked at it for a minute, and he said, well, I get it. He said, but I don't need to do an exercise in math. And he said, let me just write my own chart out. And he wrote his own chart out. He didn't use the number chart. And it would be the same. If I went to L.A., I always took a number chart, but I also took a manuscript chart. Okay. And in New York, I always took a manuscript chart. Because, you know, they, of course, they pick up on it just right away. Well, I get it, but I don't have to be thinking flat Isn't seven that, and, you know, six minor and all that kind of that's stuff. That's funny. If, if, you, if you took the written notes to Nashville and they converted to the number chart. Well, we do, we do it by ear. Yeah. You know, you listen to the demo. And I can remember going and to play on sessions in Muscle Shoals in Nashville, in Atlanta, and... They wouldn't even come in with a chart, even a number chart. They'd just play you the demo, and you sat there with your own paper making your own chart, and you'd write your numbers out. But so, you, like I said in the class today, uh, there are a number of guys who do have perfect pitch, but everybody had to have perfect relative pitch to be a good studio musician. You had to have perfect relative pitch. If you hear the note, then you know the next note to a four mm -hmm. or a six minor or whatever. You, 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 you write your own charts out. I never did that with the players when I produced. Mm -hmm. I always did the charts ahead of time with one of my musicians, usually the piano player or the guitar player, yeah. on whichever session it was. I do the charts ahead of time. I came with them, printed up, put them out in the studio, in the control room. Here's your chart. Here's the demo. Follow the chart. And I'd put in little notations like the fills on this verse, piano. I'd write it up, just piano. That meant... On that verse, the piano fills. Next verse, it might be, I don't know. Yeah, you don't want somebody to, else fills. You don't want to fill on a fill. No, no, no. You <laughs> and everybody knows to stay out of everybody's way anyway. Yeah. Yeah. But I would come in with the number charts in Nashville, and everybody, I'd run the demo, play the demo, or sit there with the guitar and play it with whoever singing, and everybody makes their notes on the chart where they're filling. If I'd write down and they'd put little notes to themselves, go out in the studio, do a rundown, and I'd always record that, because sometimes it would be the rundown. And if the chart was right, a lot of times that was the take. Then I'd do a rundown, take one, take two, maybe take three. If it went past that, I'd say something's wrong with the chart, put it away, I'll look at it during the lunch break. Next song. Move on. But mostly we got either on the rundown or take one or take two. What would get you back into the studio now? 
as a producer? It would have to be an old friend uh-huh. wanting me to do something with them again. Because if it was a new artist now, to honest, honestly, I wouldn't know what to do. I mean, I'd know what to do musically, but I wouldn't, wouldn't know what to do from there because the structure of the business has changed so dramatically since 2000, the year 2000. Uh, particularly, I look at that as the watershed year because that's when the kid came out with Napster and people were downloading music and the, just the, the income from... They're talking about now how streaming has lifted up the record company, but I still get my statements. And it's like for a stream, I'm looking at like point zero 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 two cents, you know, that type of thing. Whereas it used to be $8.8 and something, per, you know, this, that, and the yeah. other. The royalties I make now are still from the old records. Because the new stuff that's streamed, you don't make, you don't, I just read an article that about how streaming has lifted the record industry back up. But, you know, nobody hardly buys physical product anymore. There's more, almost as much vinyl sold now as there are CDs, because that's come back. But compared to how most of it's streamed, and first of all, I don't like the sound of streamed music because of the compression that's necessary. I don't care for the way records are made in the most part. So one of the students was asking me during the fire drill up here how records are made. I said, well, you know, I know all the great players that are still around, but they rarely are called in to do live sessions anymore, the way it's done mostly now, with the exception of jazz and bluegrass and classical. A producer and his artist lay down a drum loop and maybe a, an acoustic guitar or a piano. They send it to Eddie Bears, my longtime friend and drummer. They send it to Eddie. He puts down his part in the stu- in his own studio. Then it goes back up to whatever, Dropbox, iCloud, whatever. Then Michael Rhodes, the bass player, gets it, adds his part back up. Then it goes to whoever, Matt Rawlings, to add piano. And then on the, they hardly ever see each other in the studio anymore. And the, the magic was out on the floor what happened. Here's your chart. But then there's that magic when that give and take. Hey, what about this? What about this little lick right here? What about this? And that's the magic. It, that, you know, doing records like this, email them to each other or whatever. You don't get that interaction. And the guys tell me that. They said they are seldom called into a, a session anymore where they're all there. Yeah. That's, this is the way it's done. And I said, unfortunately, that's to me, that's the way the records sound. They, uh, I started hearing it oh, way back. I called it homogenization mm-hmm. because they were all mixed exactly the same. They tried to get the loudest level they could for radio at that time. And then it was like they have to be compressed tremendously to be streamed and kids listen in the earbuds and it's not the full spec- sonic spectrum anymore in those records now again I'm sure somebody will look at this it's just some old guy talking about the way it used to be I'm not bitter about it I got to do it yeah. at the right time we all said how lucky we were it was the best of those old guys that we got to learn from not just the horn players and the string players, but the great old rhythm sections like the Wrecking Crew in L.A. or the Funk Brothers in Detroit. We got to learn from them and kind of take the baton through our period. And then it just started drifting away after yeah. our era. And I, so I'm not bitter about it. I'm grateful that I did it when I did yeah. it. Well, I'm anyway, what, did, it. what it would take for me to get back, it'd have to be somebody that I worked with. Hey, let's get together. What do you think? And do it like the old days. Get the guys and the gals and do it like we used to do it. I would do that. But to take a new artist from scratch, like I used to do, sign an artist to Columbia or Vanguard, and then try to work it through this maze that exists now to try to get stuff streamed and, you know, labels. When I was talking about $100,000, $150,000, $200,000 budgets, that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, artist development doesn't exist anymore at record companies. You pretty much have to go in with a finished product and a bankroll <laughs> to you know yourself 
to to really have a record deal anymore. And most people, if you look, the major labels, that was your goal, a major label, Columbia, RCA, Capital. Now it's like everybody has their own label, practically. Yeah. Very few you see that are really signed. And if they are, they've gone through this ridiculous process that I don't want to go through anymore. Well, if you find that old friend and do it, I want to be invited so I can watch. Oh, believe okay. me. Because it, it, there's nothing like it. Okay. When it comes live at you off the floor. Well, I enjoyed our second conversation. Maybe we'll have a third. Maybe we'll have a third. Maybe we'll do like, you know, like Rambo Part 6. He's doing a sixth movie or something. I think I'd come up with another analogy. Okay. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Thank you. You're very great, much. man. Great questions. <laughs> All right.